We are now in a pretty good position to state the theorem for when a matrix does or does not have an inverse. We just need one lemma, lemma. If a square n by n matrix has n pivot positions, then when you put it in reduced row echelon form, you get the identity matrix. Let's look at this in the three by three case. Suppose this matrix has three pivot positions. When you put it into reduced row echelon form, what will happen? Well, once this is in reduced row echelon form, the leading entries, that is to say the pivot positions, have to go from left to right as you move down the matrix. Every leading entry has to be to the right of the leading entry above it. The only way we can fit three leading entries that do that into this matrix is if they're down the diagonal. So the leading entries are ones down the diagonal. Once it's in reduced row echelon form, everything below a leading entry is zero. And everything above a leading entry is zero. The leading entries are all one. And you have the identity matrix. With this lemma out of the way, let's state our real theorem for this video. Theorem. A is invertible if and only if Gauss-Jordan elimination turns A into the identity matrix I. Furthermore, the same row operations that turn A into the identity matrix turn the identity matrix into A inverse. We will prove this theorem. Suppose A is invertible. Then from a theorem from this very section, AX equals B, always has a solution. Citing a theorem we learned in section 1.4, AX equals B always has a solution if and only if A has a pivot in every row. Now, A is a square matrix. If we're talking about invertibility, 
So if saying it has a pivot in every row means that it has n pivot positions and a square n by n matrix with n pivot positions turns into I when we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. So there's our proof in one direction. Let's prove this in the other direction and also prove of this statement. Say that Gauss-Jordan elimination, which is a series of elementary row operations, turn A into the identity matrix. Here's where we'll use that elementary matrix stuff from the previous section. Gauss-Jordan elimination, that is to say, performing elementary row operations, is the same as multiplying by a bunch of elementary matrices. So we are performing a row operation with each of these products until A has turned into I. Now, every elementary row operation is invertible. We can take this equality and this in um, matrix on the left has an inverse. So we can multiply both sides of this equality by that inverse. And on the left-hand side, multiplying a matrix by its inverse, those two things cancel out. And now we can multiply both sides by this inverse, the inverse of this matrix. And we can repeat that process until we get to this. Now, multiplying by i doesn't do anything. We can ignore that. And what do we have? Well, Every elementary matrix is invertible. And if, an in, if a matrix is invertible, its inverses are also invertible. So A is the product of a bunch of invertible matrices. And a theorem from section 2.2, .2, so from earlier in this section, says that the product of invertible matrices is invertible. So we've proven part of the theorem. We've proven this if and only if part of the theorem, that A is invertible if and only if Gauss-Jordan elimination turns A to I. Let's now prove this. We're very close to being done here.
since A is invertible, we can take its inverse. I'm ignoring this I here because again, multiplication by I is like multiplication by one. It doesn't do anything. The inverse of a product, again, citing a theorem from earlier in this section, is the product of the inverses written in reverse order. So this inverse is the product of the inverses of these, and again, written in reverse order. Now, an inverse of an inverse, Citing once more a theorem from earlier in this section, cancels out. And a inverse is this product. Multiplication by I doesn't do anything, so we can throw an I in if we want. And now we've got the identity matrix I multiplied by a bunch of elementary matrices. So we're taking I and performing elementary row operations on it. What elementary row operations are we performing on I to turn it into a inverse? Precisely the same elementary row operations that we performed on A to turn it into I. And that statement is the second part of this theorem.